Start by adding three fresh gallons of water to your kettle. Place the steeping grains in the water while it's still cold. The type of grain you use will in large part determine the final color and flavor of your beer. Once you've added your grains, turn on the heat and bring the water to 155 degrees. You want to be sure to remove the steeping grain before the temperature of the water exceeds 180 degrees. This is because you don't want the husks of the grain to impart their tannins into your brew, giving it astringent flavors. The ideal conditions are to soak the grain for about 25 minutes at 155 degrees. Once you've removed the grain bag, restore the wort to high heat until it comes to a boil. Resist squeezing the grain bag when you remove it, as you want to avoid extracting those tannins. If you can't resist squeezing, rather rinse your steeping grain with a couple cups of clean boiling water. Bring the pot to a rolling boil and you're ready to add your malt. Here I'm using a liquid malt extract, although you can also get extracts in a powdered form. You want to be sure that as you add the malt, whether it's liquid or dry, you stir the wort vigorously to prevent the malt from burning to the bottom of your kettle. If you don't have someone to help you, turning off the heat might be a good idea. As the wort is brought back to boiling, be careful that about 10 minutes after adding your malt, a thick layer of cappuccino-like foam will rise to the top and potentially boil over, making a huge mess. Remove the pot from the heat source to prevent this, or use a spray bottle to tame the foam. As the proteins coagulate and get heavier, they sink back into the pot and look cloudy. This flocculation of proteins is called the hot break. After about 10 minutes, that foam will disappear and you're ready to start adding your hops. Hops come in many different forms, including pellets, plugs, or fresh whole hops. Regardless of how they're packaged, the hops are going to do two major things for your beer. Impart bitterness and give it aroma. It's the alpha and beta acids that need to be dissolved into the wort that make your beer bitter. The reason you need to boil the hops is because the resins that impart the flavor to your beer are not readily soluble in water. It's the heat and boiling, called isomerization, that allow the alpha acids to become soluble in water. Beta acids, however, only become soluble when oxidized, so it's very important to always use fresh, unoxidized hops in order to extract the small amount of beta acids available. You can control the bitterness of your beer by the amount of hops you use and the length of the time you boil your wort. Knowing how much alpha acid is in the hops you're using is also a good idea. Usually they are listed on the package. Once you add your hops, start your timer for an hour. As the pot boils, you might need to scrape the buildup of hops off the side of the kettle from time to time to keep them in the wort. Don't cover the pot at this point because sulfur compounds like dimethyl sulfide are being produced and they boil off the wort. Just before the end of the boil, you add more hops. Not for bittering, but for the aroma that it gives the beer. Some beers like India Pale Ale use a method called dry hopping where you add fresh hops directly into the fermenting carboy. This final addition of hops to the last five minutes of the hour-long boil keeps its volatile oils from boiling away and gives your beer a fantastic aroma. At the end of the boil, you want to cool the wort as quickly as possible. Cooling can be done easily by placing the entire pot into a bathtub full of ice water or shown here using an immersion wort chiller made of a copper tube coiled and placed into the pot while it's still boiling to kill any bacteria, and then running cold water from the faucet through the tube. Remember that you want to do this as quickly as possible. The reason for this is that while the wort is hot, those sulfur compounds are still being created and are not able to boil away, potentially giving your beer the taste of overcooked eggs, cabbage, or a corn-like flavor. You can potentially grow hazardous bacteria under the temperature of 140 degrees, so letting your pot sit at room temperature to cool is not a good idea. You also want to create the cold break. Similar to the hot break, you want another set of proteins to precipitate out of solution. If not cooled quickly, then they will remain in the finished beer and cause what's known as chill haze. It won't affect the taste, but it looks bad and later on can cause the beer to become stale more readily. Cooling the liquid also allows for higher oxygen absorption. After the boil, your wort will have very little oxygen, so you want to re-oxygenate it by either whisking the wort with a sterilized whisk or vigorously pouring the wort into the carboy. The colder the temperature, the better the oxygen absorption, and the more aeration, the better the yeast will take hold and adapt to their environment. This will shorten the lag time of the yeast, or the time it takes from pitching the yeast into the wort and the time you notice the foam, or crossin, forming at the top of your wort. Add cold water to the carboy to bring the total volume to 5 gallons at a temperature between 65 and 75 degrees. Grab a sample of the final wort to measure the specific gravity. You'll use this later to determine the alcohol content. Add your yeast, top it with an airlock, and go to bed.
If you've done it all correctly, you'll wake up and see a layer of hops and proteins at the bottom of the carboy and the beginning of fermentation occurring causing the airlock to bubble and a foam of crossin at the top. Most likely the fermentation will be so vigorous that the crossin will bubble right up through the airlock. If that's happening, you'll want to prevent a horrible mess by connecting a blow-off tube and run that into a bucket nearby. The compounds in the crossin can impart a bitter flavor and make your beer very harsh tasting. So if you do use a blow-off tube, it might not be a bad thing. However, it's a sticky substance and usually just clings up at the top of the fermenter, and that's just fine too. Just try not to stir it back into the beer. The primary fermentation stage will be over in about a week. You can gauge when you need to rack your beer into a new carboy by timing the bubbles coming out of the airlock. Usually when it bubbles every 90 seconds, you know the first stage is complete and it's time to siphon the beer into a new carboy. Generally by the time the crossin has disappeared, you know it's safe to rack into the secondary fermenter. Now that the yeast has gone into an anaerobic stage of metabolizing sugar into alcohol, you want to be sure not to aerate the wort any further. Keep as much oxygen away from the wort by carefully siphoning the beer from one container into another. Don't splash it around. After you've transferred it into the secondary fermenter, you can pretty much forget about it for the next few weeks. This is the time you allow the beer to condition without the worry of autolysis, which is when the yeast that settled to the bottom of the primary fermenter, or the trube, decides to break down and contribute yeasty flavors to your beer. Now's the time for bottling, except that bottling is very time consuming and probably my least favorite activity. As an alternative to bottling, I've invested in a Cornelius keg system which saves me loads of time sanitizing bottles and avoiding adding corn sugar back into the wort which can contribute to a cider-like flavor in the finished beer. All the work that's needed to keg is siphoning the beer into the sanitized Cornelius keg and connecting it to a CO2 tank. The best part of kegging is you can start drinking your beer in a few days and you don't have to wait the three weeks for the bottles to condition in order to drink the beer. I like beer cause it is good. I drink beer because I should. If there was a song to sing, I sing it and beer you bring. I drink beer when I am sad.